We know according to Deuteronomy 30 that we should choose life, right? God says choose life. But we have people talking about choice today, but they don't mean choose life. They mean choose death, right? When they talk about their choice, they're talking about a choice to die. The evolutionists who have embraced population control, they believe in euthanasia or so-called mercy killing. In fact, I believe whatever they can do to get rid of a portion of the population, they're going to embrace. It's the same worldview that tries to justify abortion. You ever hear people talk about abortion as mercy killing? That's if you can get them to admit that it's killing. But when you finally get them to admit it, then they say, well, it's better for the baby not to be born. And so, so really, it's just mercy killing. They are making the judgment that death would be better than life. But whose right is it? To make such decisions. The Lord. Well, this worldview that justifies abortion is being expanded. It has been expanded to include the elderly. It's abortion at the other end. The sick. The dying. And I believe it's another fulfillment of our prophecy in 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And when we read some of this, you're going to agree. But I don't have to tell you about perilous times. You understand abortion is very perilous for the unborn, isn't it? But notice it says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. So really all of this mercy killing, so called, is rooted in what? Selfishness, self-love. Notice it says they will be without what? Natural affection. Natural affection is that you might not love your neighbor across the street, but God, you have to work on that, but God put in you the love of your parents. You understand that? There ought to be something in you that has sympathy for those that are sick and that type of thing. Well, they're not even going to have natural affection. That's why we have abortion today. Mothers giving up their unborn to death. Well, my point today is it's happening at both ends. It's happening at the end of life, so-called, and it's happening at the beginning of life. But, never miss verse 5, having a form of godliness. They're going to cover this thing and paint this thing to where they are moral do-gooders. They're killing the unborn, but they're actually doing good. They're going to kill people by hospice, but they're actually doing good. There's a form of godliness that's painted over the evils of our age. You understand? God's Word condemns euthanasia. So this isn't one of those things that you sit back and say, Well, I just think. Because it's not your place to think in such a way. God does say, Come let us reason together. But He wants you reasoning based upon His foundation. You understand? Because your thinking is colored. It's colored by your own prejudices. It's covered by your own ignorance. It's covered by a lot of things. Our limited ability to understand. So let's just find out what God's Word. It's our moral compass, right? God's Word condemns euthanasia as murder. And Amalekite was given the death penalty for professing to euthanize Saul. 2 Samuel 1, he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me. Supposedly that Saul requesting that. And why did he want to die? For anguish has come upon me. Can some people be in so much torment or pain emotionally or physically that they want to die? Of course. Because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him. Now notice his statement. Because I was what? Sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Now that's where the game works. 
I was sure you're not going to live anyway. Can anybody make that declaration? You don't understand the doctors that have written and confessed. I was sure he was going to die, but he lived. And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. That was judicial execution for murder. When Job felt as though he... So what did David think of mercy killing, especially of the Lord's anointed? I mean, if mercy killing was right in the eyes of God, you'd think David would say, well, for Saul, who was the Lord's anointed, we definitely... Okay, as long as it was somebody that was... We don't want him to suffer. No. David said, you took his life. You're dead. Out of your own mouth, whether you did it or not. You're dead. When Job felt as though he would rather die, his friends who sat at his side did not grant his desperate desire. Now his wife said, curse God and die, but he said, you're speaking as what? One of the foolish women. But when he got in his misery, in the midst of his despair, with his friends sitting around, he says in Job 7, my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. Well, he was in desperate straits, wasn't he? You think later when the Lord raised him up and restored everything to him, I bet he was glad his friends didn't grant his request, aren't you? Mephibosheth was lame on his feet and referred to himself as a dead dog. Did he need to die? David had him sit at his table in kindness to Jonathan. If he's going to be kind to Jonathan, why didn't he kill him and put him out of his misery? What about the insane? Surely they need to die, right? If you're going to listen to this Nazi culture today. Even the Philistine king, when David feigned himself insane, did not euthanize David when he thought he was mad. Even the cruel Babylonians permitted Nebuchadnezzar to live when he went mad. They drove him out in the wilderness, but they still didn't euthanize him. The Bible warns, however, that violence and murder will fill the earth in the last days before the coming of Christ. It says it will be as in the days of Noah, and violence shall fill the world. And Revelation 19 says you'll not only have sorcery and theft, and that, that all relates to what we're talking about here, but also murder. Murder would be widespread. But here's the point. Do you think it will be called murder? Not always. Is abortion called murder? Well, I mean, we got a clinic right down the road here in Fort Worth. You know what they call them, themselves? Whole Woman's Health. Whole Woman's Health Clinic. Does that sound like a murder place? So do you think when they murder people with hospice, they're going to call it murder? No, you know what they're going to call it? They're going to call it compassion. Compassion. You know, the Bible says the tender mercies of the wicked are what? Cruel. So this is cruelty disguised as mercy. The form of godliness, they, they, they put a, an outward veneer, they say, we call it mercy. Well, that's what the Nazis called it. But it's really your cruelty. Abortion is cruel. Killing people by morphine is cruelty. So that leads us to our next section called murder by morphine. Today, a common form of euthanasia is murder by morphine. Instead of using a pillow to smother a person, the victim's respiration is shut down by the drug. Second Kings 8, it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. You know what that was? That was water burning. Boarding? That, that was murder. He killed this fellow. God had actually declared that he was going to be raised up from his bed, but God prophesied that he was going to be slain by the very servant that the king sent. And so this fella killed that man. Now notice the dangers of morphine. This was not very difficult for me to find. It's well known. We'll go to Scientific American in 1889. This stuff's been known for over a century. Scientific American, 1889. Morphine death occurs from paralysis of what? I want everybody to look at it. Of the what? Respiratory center. And morphine 
poisoning, a lowering of the blood pressure plays an important part. So morphine, the more you get of it, the slower you breathe and the more you struggle to breathe and the lower your blood pressure goes. Which means morphine stops your lungs and stops your heart. Now, you think about this for a second. When you're in a hospital room and they've got that patch or they've got that drip and they've got somebody on morphine and you're like, well, their, their blood pressure's falling and, and, and there it is. Now, now, they're having trouble breathing. I guess they're getting to the point of death. And then the nurse comes in and says, well, they're probably struggling. Let's, let's, let's add a little extra morphine. And the family says, yes, yes, yes. And then they add that extra morphine. And then it does that dry rattle, that death rattle. And they can barely breathe. And finally take that last breath. And everybody joins and prays. Okay, you just witnessed death by morphine. Death. I don't care what you call it. If the nurse would have took a pillow and smothered the person, you'd call it murder. If they give a morphine, everybody goes and says, oh, well, they were a good fellow. R.H. Mansky in Pharmacology, 1965. Little quantitative information on the morphine problem. They call it the morphine problem. Has been gathered with man as the subject. Time and again, reference is made to a slow respiratory rate after the administration of morphine. Toxic doses of morphine may cause a fatal interference in the respiration. Therapeutic doses of morphine may induce extreme respiratory depression in who? Certain sick individual. But who do they give morphine to? Sick individual. But they say, we didn't give a toxic dose, we gave a therapeutic dose, a helpful dose. The American practitioner, let's go back to 1887. The sedative effects which opium or morphine exert upon the, uh, morphine comes from opium, exert upon the respiratory system should certainly contraindicate their employment in cases in which respiratory embarrassment or failure would be likely to occur. Okay, elderly, the sick, those with complications, those that are having trouble breathing anyway, those with emphysema, those with COPD. I mean, come on, we could just name it. It's obvious you shouldn't be giving morphine to this person. An illustration of this may be cited the following remarkable case in which it seemed probable that the cessation of breathing which occurred was partly or wholly to be attributed to morphine, thus administered. The patient was a young woman who presented unmistakable symptoms of a cerebral cerebral tumor. A hypodermic injection of morphine was given. As the operation proceeded, respiration became more and more feeble and then ceased. It was restored by artificial means, but again ceased and was again restored. One hour and a quarter after the commencement of the operation, it ceased for the third time and could not be made to return. The patient died, and everybody knows she died by morphine. Pain reliever, so-called. They'll call anything a pain reliever. Anything that gets you high is a pain reliever if it takes your mind off the pain. In spite of these facts, morphine or a similar drug is commonly given to very sick, weak people. And when the respiration shuts down, it is then claimed that the person died of their sickness. But did they die of their sickness? No. I want to relate a few moments my experience of viewing my aunt's death with hospice. My aunt was brought home. We asked, can we now try natural means on her since the doctors have given up? We were told no. So I traveled as fast as I could, and we got to South Carolina. They said, you can go in and see her. When I walked in, it looked like somebody from a concentration camp that had been starved and dehydrated, and I saw her look up at me with those eyes, and uh, I just about lost it at that time. And I came back, hospice came in, and everybody was talking about, let's give her more morphine, let's give her more morphine. I kept protesting to not put her on any more of it. One of the relatives that was sitting there, uh, a brother-in-law, she finally, the the hospice lady kept looking at her watch, kept saying very cruel things like, uh, I really don't think she's going to last many, very many hours. And uh, 
Finally, her ex-husband walked over and whispered something in her ear, and we heard her, uh, you know, move and say something. And so I looked at the hospice lady. I said, obviously, she can hear everything you're saying. The hospice lady said, well, yeah, I guess they can hear. And so I'm like, well, lady, you've been sitting here saying the most wicked things in front of my aunt about her death, talking about it like it's no big deal. Well, finally, finally, the nurse became very anxious and kept pressing. Can we get more morphine? Let's get more morphine. The family kept saying no. Maybe they did it for my sake. I don't know. But they kept saying no. And then she finally said, well, she needs a little more morphine. Look at her. And she's struggling. Because she turned her over on her side and she kind of struggled. My wife walked in and said, well, turn her back on the other side where she was more comfortable and everything was fine. Finally, she said, I want to give her a little more morphine. Uh, My cousin's husband, because they're all nurses around there, he said, well, doesn't morphine stop the breathing? She looked over and she said, it can, but it also helps the breathing. At that point is when my eyes opened. They administered some more morphine. She went into the death rattle, couldn't breathe anymore. People left the room. I sat and watched my aunt die and take her last breath. After watching this terrible situation unfold, I left, got in my car. I heard the hospice lady call up the ambulance and get angry and say, I didn't say send the ambulance. There's a do not resuscitate on her. So tell the ambulance to go back home. I got in the car, drove to the hospital, uh, drove to the hotel. It was very early in the morning. I told my wife, I said, you know what I just witnessed was death by morphine. I think this is happening all around the country. And I think it's as big as abortion is. And uh, basically when I get on the computer, when I go home, we're going to expose an entire movement. It's like having your eyes open to uh, CPS or abortion. or uh, when, When your eyes finally see through the veneer what they're trying to say, and you get your eyes open for the first time. I typed on the computer. I found case after case after case of people talking about this agenda, this Holocaust in America. I said, there it is right there. There it is. Man is playing God for money and for convenience sake. The day I arrived back in town was that Saturday morning. So I went uh, street preaching that night. I met Matt downtown who happened to be there. He didn't expect us to be there on Saturday, you know, so he's in our spot. And I walked over to him and said hello. And he looked at me and said, did you get my new newsletter? I said, well, I think you mail them to me or whatever. And he said, okay. And then he looked over at me and he says, you know, hospice is killing people. It's involuntary euthanasia, he said. And then he said, morphine shuts down the respiration. I said, what did you just say? I was in shock. I said, do you know what I have went through these past couple of days? Do you know what I've been telling my wife the whole way home? And here you are telling me this. I told him what I had found and of our own experience with this sick agenda just a few days earlier. Here's an excerpt from this man's newsletter on the subject. Dr. Dream's death. I'm sorry, Dr. Death's dream. Kevorkian's obsession with death could be seen in his oil painting. His work leaned toward the grotesque. Jack Kevorkian is now dead, but his dream has become a reality. Prior to my dad's death, I started hearing horror stories concerning hospice care, which reaffirmed that I made the right decision concerning my dad. He chose not to send his dad to hospice, and his dad died naturally. And in his last year, last year of life, was able to uh, discourse with the family and died peaceably in his sleep. He said, there are endless horror stories across America. Dr. Death's dream has come true. That is why most patients who sign up for hospice only live for four or five days. Family members usually watch in horror as their loved ones gasp for breath. Hospice workers are either knowingly participating in the deception, embracing the euthanasia philosophy. In other words, they know good and well what they're doing. 
or else they're simply deceived by their training. And their training is in such a way where if they choose to believe the lie, it's there for them to make them feel better. Though I believe most of them, I I just personally believe most of them know it's a lie, but they believe what they're doing is good. They believe that they're helping the family. They believe they're helping the victim. They believe they're helping society. Well, the abortion workers, they believe they're doing good. You get my point? Some might be simply deceived by their training. Notice the following deceptive propaganda that hospice workers are indoctrinated to believe. You could go to quality of life care, a palliative care resource center. Now, before I read this, you need to know what palliative care is. It's the philosophy of hospice. What palliative means is alleviating pain. Now, let me ask you a question. Is pain sometimes good? Is pain sometimes necessary? Okay, Hebrews 12 says, lift up the arms that hang down so the doctor can, can straighten it up and keep it from getting stiff. And we know detoxing might feel miserable, but it helps you in the end. So, this idea of we're not going to heal you, we're here to alleviate your pain. That's a totally different philosophy, isn't it? That's a totally different philosophy. That's very sadistic. But morphine is one of many drugs, says this resource center, that is used to treat moderate to severe pain. You're sure not healing anybody with it, that's for sure. In hospice medicine, we use it all the time. Oh, yes, I know you do. But there is the thought in the medical community outside of hospice that morphine causes respiratory depression and that this phenomenon is always bad. Is that not an amazing statement? She's saying, well, the doctors keep telling us that morphine is killing people. What I've seen over and over again is that it works. What does that mean? Well, the person goes unconscious and takes their last breath. They weren't screaming. It's amazing what it does for a person's life. Is that what it says? Quality of life. Is defined by who? Quality of life? Well, they weren't struggling anymore. Oh, no, just struggling to breathe. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, Oh, no, we can't treat shortness of breath with morphine. It causes respiratory depression. That's what my relative cried out. But just try it. You have nothing to lose but the suffering. See, they wrote this for people in elderly homes and people that are sick, so they'll go tell their nurse, I want morphine. Just try it. You have nothing to lose. No, 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 nothing but your life, but that's not considered anything. Patients are often sedated into unconsciousness and then starved to death or dehydrated. So the idea is this. Uh... We give you this sedation, so now you don't desire food. You don't want to swallow. And then they say, well, we're not going to do anything. If they don't want food, we're not going to give them food. I know, but you sedated them into unconsciousness. Now you're starving them, dehydrating them. That's what happened to my aunt. But they come in and wash you. They don't give you any water for your mouth, but they'll come in and wash you, keep you comfortable. When they then begin to show signs of suffering from their starvation. And by the way, signs of morphine withdrawal are very violent. Grabbing the sheets and going crazy. So really all you have to do technically is walk in, give somebody a little bit of morphine. A couple of days later, withdraw it. Then all of a sudden the patient's going crazy on the bed. Then you say, oh, they're suffering. Do you see that? They're in pain. Let's now give them morphine. That's a pretty cute game, isn't it? Pretty cute game. So when you see signs of starvation, they're then given dangerous doses of morphine that soon stops the breathing and stops the heart, etc. I'll pause right now and give you a Bible verse. In Proverbs 24, wisdom is too high for a fool. 
He openeth not his mouth in the gate. You know what a lot of people like to do when they're faced with information like this? They say, you know what? I, I, I just can't get into all of that right now. I don't even want to think about that. It's too high for you. Get my point? They don't want to go public with that. They don't want to speak up for those that are hurting. It's commonly justified by claiming that so-called terminal patients would want things this way. Yet the Lancet, June 29, 1996, went and interviewed a bunch of them and found that such patients experiencing significant pain of dying of cancer were more opposed to euthanasia than the general public. How about that? Surprise. They said, no, we don't want assisted suicide. You get one or two that says they want to be killed, but Job wanted to die. That, that happens all the time. But you get these people, most of them said, no, I don't want you coming in. Most of them are saying, don't bring me any more morphine. I don't want morphine. It's for your own good. Folks, you woke up in a Nazi nightmare. One whistleblower nurse couldn't take it anymore. His name was Ron, his name is Ron Panzer. And he's working hard to expose this tyranny in the name of compassion. I'm not sure what his religious affiliation is, but he believes in God. After witnessing serious violations in standard of care by Michigan Hospice, he founded the Hospice Patients Alliance. Go to that website. It's filled with tons of information. In an email to me, Panzer writes, Yes, morphine slows the breathing, drops the blood pressure, sedates into a coma. The lies are terrible. In only rare cases does it help. For example, end-stage heart failure with pulmonary edema. However, if no diuretic is given, then you know they're lying about it. Yes, it relaxes so the patient is, quote, comfortable as they are killed. You can use whatever you wish of my writings. It was written to serve him and the people. So therefore, I'm going to quote from his book that he gave me permission to use. He's written a book entitled Stealth Euthanasia. Stealth, euthanasia, healthcare tyranny in America. Stealth means what? Under the radar. So, we don't need to have euthanasia passed in America. We'll work on that down the road once a new generation of people in public school have been indoctrinated into the death culture. But for right now, we'll just do it under the radar by a different name. Stealth, euthanasia. In this book, he writes, This book contains the most censored story in America, and we cannot guarantee that this information will be available in the future. It offers a rare glimpse from my experience within the end-of-life industry. My work as a patient advocate and includes the revelations of hundreds and hundreds of people as they have recounted it to me. I have many friends with the hospice industry who confirm what I recount here in this book. This is the story of the intentionally below-the-radar changes that have been aggressively pursued in our society for decades. Because these changes are not covered by the major media in any coherent, connected way or at all, the public has difficulty putting a finger on what is happening and why. See, people have this idea, if this was wrong, I'd know about it. Well, it makes you think you'd know about it. Well, they'd be talking about it on CNN. That's how the average person thinks. But what if the people who fund CNN believe in euthanasia? Now what's going to happen? Are they going to expose it? No. It's been coming for over 70 years. Americans have been quietly asleep while those who have made war on American values achieve success after success. When family members recount what hospice staff said to them, the language and phrases used sometimes were exactly the same. When I read these stories, I couldn't believe it. I just witnessed this exact same thing with my aunt. The actions taken exactly the same. The outcome exactly the same. The reason? Simple. The staff at different agencies across the country are being trained in the same way. The Euthanasia Society is connected with the largest segment of the hospice industry in America. 
the largest hospice organization in our nation, is the successor organization to the Euthanasia Society of America. So he shows the chart, shows the name changes, shows the time. Really, the Euthanasia Society of America said, we're not getting anywhere by calling it euthanasia. We'll call it hospice. And guess what happens? Everybody embraces it. And what people do is they say, well, don't you believe some good's coming out of it? But when you use that type of logic to try to cover over evil, where are you going to stop using that? See what I mean? Many hospices in the United States today have no reservations about hastening death through a method called terminal sedation. Some hospices may go years without being inspected. Nobody interested in researching what is actually going on in hospice can get access to the data. So hospices that have an agenda can act without any outside interference. So they have this almost unparalleled ability to go in, do what they're doing, and you can't question them. You can't even look and see what happened. You can't look at the record. This is how Robin Love's father, who was not terminal was hauled off to hospice, deprived of food and water, and was given large doses of morphine and sedatives. He died shortly thereafter. What the public thinks about hospice is a carefully constructed image. You could say that our society has been manipulated, maneuvered, even conditioned to think in ways that are completely contrary to the way Americans thought for the past two centuries. And millions and millions of dollars have been spent to achieve this. Many people have adopted the, quote, quality of life ethic, where it's okay to end someone's life because they are seriously disabled, very elderly, have dementia, or any number of other reasons. In a very real sense, many of us have become numb to the killings. If there were no medical murders, books like Caring to Death, A Discursive Analysis of Nurses Who Murder Patients by John Field, where over 50 cases of nurse killers from around the world are discussed, I just read about five or six of them the other day online that are making the news over in Britain and elsewhere where where nurses are caught killing people, caught letting people dehydrate without any water over and over again. I, I just read news headline the other day that says I killed my mother with morphine and I'm going to kill my daddy too. And over in Europe, they're talking about how, well, yes, when it comes time to die, when they're at the end of their life, we'll just go ahead and put them out of their misery with morphine. We're all doing it. Everybody's doing it. And they're putting this stuff in the paper to get you talking about it, to get you accepting this whole culture of death. These are sensational cases that make the news. But with stealth euthanasia... Policymakers, nurses, doctors, and others whose actions or decisions cause death are not apprehended, and they certainly are not prosecuted. Magazine articles promote hospices the other way to make someone die on demand. We have reports that when families refuse to go along, da da, hospital staff use social service agencies to get their way. You know they do it with children, but guess what? It's happening with the elderly. Um, No, I think I'm taking my mom out of here. Thank you. Oh, well, I'll call APS. APS? Are you kidding? What's APS? Adult Protective Services. You're denying morphine. Well, yeah, I'm denying morphine. Give me my mama. Oh, if you take her out of here, I'm sorry. But but, uh, that's what's happening across the country. Y'all awake? Hospital staff may intimidate family members into signing a do not resuscitate order and then put their loved one into hospice. So once you've signed that, they give them the morphine drip, they can't breathe anymore, and you've already signed do not resuscitate, they're dead. It happens every day. It is it is as if our society is lynching the elderly and disabled and nobody comes to rescue them. In the United Kingdom, Dr. Howard Martin stated in 2011 that giving morphine to terminally ill patients in hospital to end their lives was a regular occurrence. Doctors are saying it's occurring in hospitals. It's just occurring more in hospices. 
Hospice is a philosophy, exclaim some websites run by hospice business entities. I can tell you that for about 30 years it's been a business. It's corporate. And it's big and it's getting bigger every year. In many cases, adult protective service system is even used to intimidate those who truly care about the patient and object to clinically unnecessary or harmful interventions. The top administrators at many big hospice businesses are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. Even though hospice corporations take in donations, they are funded mostly by the federal government's Medicare and state Medicaid program. So, you know, somebody dies and they say, please send any donations to hospice, you know. Well, they're getting money from Medicare. Now, why in the world would Medicare want to fund hospice? Because hospice saves big bucks over acute hospital care. You got a person, they're dying. Medicare is going to have to continue to support that person as they sit there dying. If you can just kill them, then guess what? They save money. So it's better to give hospice money to go kill people with morphine because in the end, they save money. If you know of any other industry where the funding is increasing by $1 billion each year, let me know. So the federal government's putting a $1 billion into hospice because they get money back. The federal government obviously has big plans for hospice and its future role in the American health care system and in your life and your family's lives. You'd be wise to take a look at Obamacare and find out what it says about hospice. With the baby boomers moving into the elderly category, more and more of them are developing acute and chronic conditions. You think the government wants to sit and pay money for that? Hastening death at the end of life is done in many ways, and deception is often used. Other methods of hastening death include giving medications that are not needed. The elderly may never recover from these adverse effects, and then they're labeled dementia patients. Overdose symptoms may include extreme drowsiness, confusion, muscle weakness, fainting, or coma. In Nazi Germany, the Nazis began to implement their eugenics and extermination program by executing the frail, the mentally ill, the terminally ill, and other chronically ill by order of the federal German government because of their evolution death philosophy, which we have the same philosophy in our culture today. Psych drugs cause death in dementia patients, and yet they're given to dementia patients. Stealth euthanasia. Records of those victimized by stealth euthanasia are always falsified to reflect a natural death. Morphine overdose. You think it's going to say died by morphine overdose? No, not usually. Morphine overdose or terminal sedation is almost never listed as the cause of death. Yes, you can prove that the doses of morphine were too large. The problem the hospice agency will hire two or ten physicians who will swear just the opposite. Today, the justification is given that it's all being done for the good of the suffering patient. Guess what? The Nazis used exactly that language. One hospice volunteer with 20 years experience called me in tears a while back. She had started working at a new hospice home and every patient was sleeping continuously. It was terminal sedation for everybody. Right to life groups act as if they're totally in the dark when it comes to the realities of the end of life care industry. I mean, we need to get folks interested, get folks speaking out about that. They say, well, I'm against abortion. Well, you ought to be against killing elderly people by morphine, too. We ought to just be against all death. That's wrong. Unjustified. Families report overhearing conversations between two hospice nurses who thought no family member was present. The nurse said, I'm just like Jack Kevorkian, but I do it with morphine and I get away with it. I can't tell how many times through the years family members will call and tell me how their loved one was overdosed with morphine. Often they report that the hospice nurse will tell them, morphine helps the breathing. That's exactly what I heard. I mean, it's obvious what it's doing. It's slowing down her breathing. I watched it with my own eyes. I watched her look at her watch and say, you know, I, I can't decide whether I need to go home or come back. And so she kept pressuring. Can we put her on more morphine? When somebody said, doesn't morphine stop the breathing? She said, well, it can, but it can also help comfort them. Morphine helps the breathing. 
That specific line is repeated over and over again all across the country. So I know the staff are being trained to believe this. Proverbs 24 says, If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? It's a good verse, isn't it? You see stuff like this, it's a lot easier just to say, you know, I don't know anything about that. Children that are getting the inheritance from grandmama, it's a lot easier for them to say, I don't know anything about that. When nobody in the family says, she's not coming to my house, I don't want to take care of her. Let's just... Do whatever. Maybe she needs more, more morphine. She's, she's obviously struggling. And the nurse is there to help you do it. The Hospice Alliance website reports there are actually letters received from families all over the nation. Deaths are common. Hey, the Bible said he that provideth not for his own is worse than what? An infidel. We got infidels running all around America today. In Christian churches, they're killing little babies. They call it abortion. And the churches are tolerated. Nobody's doing anything about it. I tell you what, if you expose how many were killing their relatives through morphine, it'd be unbelievable. It'd be unbelievable. Deaths are commonly covered up through false charting in the medical record. For example, a patient who receives massive doses of morphine and who has no pain has in his chart patient complaining of pain when there was no pain before, during, or after receiving the morphine. I've watched them come over and manipulate, turn her over till she gets her grunting and then claim there's pain. All kinds of games. Kaiser Health Plan instructs its patients instructs its patients and nurses that morphine helps breathing. But Charles Phillips, doctor, patient advocate, and former Kaiser physician, comments, morphine is like a loaded gun, which is so powerful it can kill a patient by lowering their blood pressure and stopping the breathing. Whistleblower. Morphine slows down the breathing. Not only does it sedate in large doses or doses that are not needed, it shuts breathing down completely and can cause death. And conveniently, for those who wish to hasten death, guess what? The signs of morphine overdosage are the same as some of the signs of imminent death. Sharply decreased blood pressure and much slower breathing, sometimes stopping at times. I think morphine killed them. Oh no, that wasn't the morphine. They were dying anyway, remember? Those nurses who have been miseducated to believe that morphine is the solution for breathing problems see the outward signs of the morphine overdosage, but interpret them as showing the patient is dying. They believe in what they've been taught, and they give morphine freely for breathing. If the patient dies, the family and staff are led to believe the patient died of their illness, not the morphine. That is the last thing the hospice or Kaiser wants them to believe. You know, somebody's dying of cancer and they give them radiation and a chemical cocktail poison and then they die. Do they put on there, died of a chemical cocktail poison? No, they said they died of cancer. But you know what, I'm convinced, I, thought that was the, I thought that was the highest evil that you could basically ever see. People dying of the drugs they give them. And I thought that was, but you know what, they're not even dying of the drugs. They would if they continue giving it. They're dying of the morphine. So, a person finds out they have cancer, or they say you have cancer. They put you on the drug. They say, I don't think the drugs are working. So, they send you home. Then they send hospice over to your house. They give you morphine and you die. And they say, well, you die. Did they die of cancer? No. Did they die of cancer medicine? No. They died from hospice murder. Wow. Many layers to this thing. I recently received some vitriolic emails from just such a miseducated hospice nurse, Stephen M., a registered nurse with special certification in palliative care who works in a hospice. He wrote, Morphine is not what kills people, you morons. It is their time to go when God, little g, takes them when he's ready. 
You or anyone could drink the entire Roxanol liquid morphine bottle, which has 30 milliliter, milliliters in it. That is a large amount. You would not die. You know, it's the same type of emails you get from homosexuals, isn't it? These are the type of emails you get from people that know in their heart they are murdering people and they've just been exposed to it. That from a certified hospice professional. But you don't even have to go to the material I gave you. You can go to the maker of morphine themselves and read what they say about morphine. Here it is. Acute overdosage with morphine is manifested by respiratory depression, stupor or coma, low blood pressure, and death. Where did Stephen M. R. N. get his ideas? From hospice management. I mean, don't you think they have enough sense to indoctrinate their workers and what to say, knowing what the chief objection is going to be to their murder? Any of these government agencies that do these evil things indoctrinate you in the philosophy of what to say. They promote this type of misinformation, which all tends toward hastening the death of the patient. There is a reason the major media wishes uh, refuses to publish the truth about hospice and palliative care and health care reform and stealth euthanasia. Most of the major media outlets like the Washington Post, ABC News, CNN and others have direct connections to those who support the culture of death approach. George Soros and others. Soros has poured millions into the major media and he traced some of that money and showed how it's being used to fund hospice propaganda in America today. I've had calls from families whose loved one was found upon autopsy to never have had cancer. This is right here. You have cancer. See the little chart? You have it. You're sick. We need surgery. We need uh, a cancer medicine. They were placed in hospice because a surgeon told them the patient had inoperable cancer. Uh, Doc, are you sure I have inoperable cancer? Well, sure. You want me to go get another surgeon? My, my buddy, I play golf with every week. He says you have it too. The cause of death listed on the death certificate? Lung cancer or something like that. What was the real cause of death? Hospice care. Now, the government loves hospice. Why does the government love hospice? Why? You got it. Why does it save them money? Well, they don't want you drawing Social Security and Medicare and all that other stuff. The media loves hospice. Why do they love hospice? Well, they're funded by these same folks. But they also love it. Why? They think it's moral. They've been educated in that brainwashed, sick society that believes in population control and abortion all of that stuff. Where they should believe in execution, they don't believe in it. I'm against the death penalty. I'm, you're just, you people are warped. Hospitals love hospice. And greedy children or spouses who can't wait to get their hands on the money, the house, and the estate love hospice. And it might not even be that. When people are about to have a baby and they weren't ready for it because they didn't listen to the preacher and didn't listen to their parents and they got out of here and messed around and now they've got a baby on their hands. They say, I, I can't, I, I, I'm young. I can't be tied down with a baby. And so they go and they abort it. And everybody pats them on the back and says, you did the right thing. Well, you might not want to steal grandma's money, but you just might simply be, I don't want grandma around my house. I can't, I can't deal with this. What's the difference in aborting a child and aborting grandma? What's the difference? A caller said, My sister killed my father by using hospice. And that was from a trained registered nurse with two decades of experience. Family members are often afraid to speak out. I mean, it's hard. If my eyes would have been more open to it, you better believe I would have spoke out. But my eyes were just now being... I smelled it. 
I've been around long enough to know when I'm about to crack open something, I said, this thing's about to crack. They're killing people with morphine. But I was still a little too fuzzy about it. Still a little too fuzzy about it. And then when I finally started realizing it's happening, what do you do? What do you say other than, I, I don't think my aunt needs any more morphine. If I'd have known all of this, I would have done more. But it would have, it would have put a big rift between me and the rest of my family. Here's another letter that he received. My mother was recently a hospice patient. While under hospice care, she died of acute morphine intoxication. This has been confirmed by an autopsy. And I know that this is not an isolated case. What I find particularly disturbing is that my mother did not want to take the Roxanol, the liquid morphine, and that's what caused her death. And don't worry, they'll just stick it under their lip there so it dissolves into their skin. They'll give them a patch. See, if they can't swallow because of the morphine, they, they've done sedated them to such a degree that they can't swallow, they'll just stick a patch on them. And then it gets inside their system. And when they need it in there quickly, they'll just put it inside their lip. And, and I was awake enough to say, now wait a second now, if you can put medicine in my wife's, uh, in, in my aunt's lips and have it dissolve in her body, why can't you put water there? See? He said, well, she's not taking water anymore. Well, then why is she taking medicine? See, see, contradictions started developing in my mind here. And that's what caused her death. The hospice nurses kept insisting that it would help her breathe. Although everything we read stated that morphine made from opium would actually slow down her breathing. It could even stop it completely. My brother and myself were encouraging my mother to take it based on what the hospice kept telling us. We trusted them. The day before her death, the hospice nurse came into our home and said that the attending physician said my mom could have 20 milligrams of Roxanol every two hours. That's exactly what this nurse said. That was four times the amount we had been given her. The nurse administered the larger, the larger dose. The last thing I remember my mom ever saying, but I just had some. The following morning, my mom, now in a coma, the hospice nurse returned. She insisted that my mom needed some more Roxanol. These folks are pushers of death. Pushers of death. My mother's, just as the doctors push drugs upon you and needless surgery, the hospice workers push death. They push death. That's what they're there for. My mother's breathing rate had slowed down considerably. And I vehemently said no, telling the nurse that I still felt as though the morphine had caused the coma. She denied. She said my mom was actively dying. Well, she was actively dying. She was. The morphine intoxication. It had nothing to do with the morphine, said the nurse. The nurse told me it was inhumane to allow her to struggle for breath as she was. That's what they pull for the rest of the family. When you're sitting there and you have a little bit of sense, you might not have much, but you have a little bit of sense, and you said, no, no, I don't think my relative needs any more morphine, then they say you're inhumane. It just takes away the pain. And when they say it takes away the pain, you're going to hear the death rattle in just a couple of hours, if not instantly. And then they'll go get the rest of the family and say, come in, it's almost time. Well, I guess it is almost time. The morphine's setting in, isn't it? It's been about six hours. It should be sitting in about now. She can't breathe, can she? The nurse told me it was inhumane to allow her to struggle for breath as she was. The morphine would only help to make breathing easier. My mom died later that evening. Now I know that morphine killed my mom. The hospice way of ending life is called the third way. It's the third option. It openly admits that it does not try to lengthen or preserve life. Notice, cancer.net. Hospice care is humane and compassionate care. Well, they want to keep hitting that, don't they? Humane and compassionate. Humane and compassionate. They want to tell you over and over and over and over because it's the opposite. And it does not slow down or speed up. The end of life. Does anybody know what they just said? 
Do you know what they just said? They admit this. Now, you know there's a whole other agenda they're not admitting out in the open. But this they freely admit. What did they just say? We don't do anything to slow down your dying. If you have been put on hospice, no, no, no. We're not going to do anything to slow... Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of morphine here, but that's just for comfort. Oh, now that's made you delusional to where now you don't even want to eat? Well, if you don't ask for any food, I'm not going to give you any. Because that would be slowing down death. If you ask for water, I might give you some. Which is a little more morphine. Just a little bit. It'll help you. Basically, they say, we're not going to do anything to preserve your life. That's sick. That's sick. You people admit that you're sick. This is why they often let patients starve or die of thirst. Yet, I just read to you the other day a doctor in the 19th century who forced olive oil down a boy's swollen mouth and throat when he had been bitten by a poisonous snake and saved his life. What would hospice say? If they're going to be consistent. Oh, the boy can't swallow? His throat's all swollen? Well, you know, if he wants the medicine, we'll give it to you. But if, if, if you can't swallow, I'm not going to force it. But the doctor stuck his tongue down there and forced that olive oil into his system and cleaned his blood all out, and the boy lived. But not hospice. No. However, they're lying because all too often they do speed up death since lethal medication is used to circumvent the laws prohibiting euthanasia assisted suicide. If they said we're going to give them a lethal dose of poison to kill them, they call that in the, in the law assisted suicide. That's technically illegal, at least in America. However, what if we change the wording and it's not lethal injection, it is lethal medication. It's for comfort. Well, then that's not technically suicide. Even though you arrive at the same place and it circumvents the law. Ron Panzer was quoted in Celebrate Life magazine in 2007, an article he titled The Invisible Holocaust. He says, protect your family from the invisible holocaust. Lonely and abandoned. Patients exhibit blank, ghoulish stares, reminiscent of concentration camp victims. I saw it with my own eyes. If they will not die soon enough, some nursing homes even call in hospice workers to facilitate premature death. Many experience hospice at its most lethal, receiving no food or fluids, increasing dosages of morphine and sedatives until a patient's life is snuffed out. Politicians know that dead citizens no longer require Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, hospital care, or other services. Hospices are reimbursed for each day a patient is enrolled. But notice this. Don't miss this now. There is a cap on reimbursement. When the cap is reached, the hospice loses money every day the patient continues to live. There it is. Follow the money. You better ask if grandma's uh, or aunt or whoever, you better ask, have we reached the cap yet? Because I know you're going to come in and start changing your tune once that cap is reached. We cannot learn how many patients are killed because medical records are private and healthcare workers are forbidden from discussing their patients. Our system's ability to create a private death camp in any healthcare bed is sinister genius at work. I have spoken to major media reporters about these cases many times, but their managers refuse to expose it because they embrace the secular agenda and euthanasia. American doctors and nurses no longer wear the all-white uniforms that were a symbol of their pure intentions and a sign that we could wholeheartedly trust them to care. 
This invisible holocaust isn't a future possibility. It is now. Proverbs 31 verse 8 says, Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Is it just babies in the womb? It's all who are wrongly being appointed to destruction. They're being appointed by doctors, hospice workers, government, relatives. It's sick stuff, folks. But I pray your eyes have been opened to whatever degree. And I pray we can do whatever we can do to expose it. And by God's grace, keep this stuff from our family.